Hello everyone. In this video today, we are going to talk about how to implement dynamic programming in Haskell. Dynamic programming in Haskell has a distinct style to it because of two main quirks of how Haskell as a language operates. Typically, we make use of mutable data structures in dynamic programming to store our computations, which we can then look up later. But Haskell does not work with any mutable objects. There are simply no variables in Haskell. The second quirk is Haskell's feature of lazy evaluation, which, as we shall see in this video, is the most important feature that makes dynamic programming in Haskell very declarative and very simple. Before we jump in, I want to briefly describe what dynamic programming is. Simply said, it revolves around the idea of solving a big and complex problem optimally if you know how to divide this problem into two or more sub-problems optimally, how to recursively solve each of those sub-problems optimally. The technical phrase to describe these kinds of problems in computer science is problems having an optimal substructure. Let's look at an example. Perhaps the most famous and one of the simplest one is the problem of finding the nth Fibonacci number. Any Fibonacci number is recursively defined as the sum of its two predecessor except for the first two numbers which are just defined as one. We can see that the problem of computing any Fibonacci number has the optimal substructure property because we can break down this problem into two smaller subproblems. Assuming we know how to compute the n-1th and n-2th Fibonacci number optimally, we can solve for nth Fibonacci number optimally as adding the answers of the two subproblems is a trivial task. Note that we can just write a program to solve this problem using recursion in any of the modern programming languages such as Java, as you can see here on your screen. But it would be terribly slow since we are constantly recalculating previously computed solutions again and again. To demonstrate this, let's implement this naive approach in Haskell. So let's define a function called fibsrec. The type signature for this function is from integer to integer. And we can use condition guards on the argument to say that for any n less than or equal to 1, we are going to simply return 1. Otherwise, we are going to make a recursive call on n minus 1 and another recursive call on n minus 2 and simply adding up the results okay the program compiles let's reload our module and let's see if we can get it so the 0 Fibonacci number is 1 first is 1 second is the addition of 2 and that works in fact if you want to just map this from 0 to 10 then you can get the first 11 Fibonacci numbers but to demonstrate how bad this solution really is let's try to calculate maybe like 31st Fibonacci number and as I hit enter you can see that it takes at least a couple of seconds to calculate the value well that's not good it's just the 31st number what if I do something like FIPS rec 100 then as you can see the program is stuck because it is recalculating the subproblems again and again and again and just wasting time. How do we optimize this? Well, in order to speed up the time of execution, we need to perform the time and memory trade-off. As we solve any of the subproblems for the first time, we store the result of that subproblem in our memory. When we encounter that subproblem again, we don't recalculate but simply look it up from the memory. As I said before, in Haskell, we cannot allocate a variable data structure like an array to hold the solutions to its subproblems and then look up whenever we need them. However, we can make use of Haskell's lazy evaluation feature and self-referential data structures to build up the infinite list of solutions to these subproblems. Let's see this in action. So in Haskell, I can define a statement like once, which is a list of once, like this. And this compiles without any problem because yeah once a list of ones is one appended by another list of ones until i force haskell to evaluate all the ones it won't calculate them but once forced to it will 
keep on lazily evaluating until the infinity or until I interrupt this program. However, this doesn't mean that this definition is useless. If somewhere I just need a list of three ones, I can say take three ones and the program will terminate with the desired output. Let's use this in our dynamic programming solution to calculate the Fibonacci numbers. Now we are going to define FibsTP as not a function from integer to integer like we did last time, but rather just a list of integers. And then FibsTP would be defined as a list whose zeroth element is 1, whose first element is also 1, and then from 2 to infinity, uh, we take each of the natural number and then just map it to the recursive definition that we had seen before. But this time, instead of making the recursive call, we can self-reference the list itself to get the n-1 and n-2 Fibonacci numbers. So we can simply say FibsTP and then use the bang bang operator, which is index, to get the n-1 and do the same for FibsTP, bang bang, n-2. And let's see if this compiles. It still compiles. That's good. And now remember, this is an infinite data structure. So instead of just doing FibsTP and getting the enter, we are just going to take 10 FibsDP. And it's going to give you the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. In order to actually get the nth Fibonacci number, which is what our problem was, we simply take the n plus 1th. So let's say we want 100. So we say 101th. Fibonacci number, okay, FibsTP, and just get the last element of this. It's going to give you the 101 Fibonacci number. Unlike the last problem, which had struggled to even calculate the 31st or 40th Fibonacci number, here the solution is very quick. This approach really scales to even multi-dimensional dynamic programming. As you can see in this problem of defining n choose k recursively, the recursive definition involves two variables, so it's a 2D dynamics programming problem. But our declarative style does not need to change except for the fact that our DP list would now be a list of list of solutions to the subproblems instead of list of solutions themselves. So for n equal to 0, we only have one way of choosing anything, which is choosing nothing. For n equal to 1, we can choose none or choose the only one value which is available. So in total, two ways. For the rest of the ends, it's simply the encoding of the recursive definition in the comment for all k between 0 and n and prepending and appending it with 1 on either side in case of choosing nothing versus choosing everything. And that concludes our video for today. If you found this helpful, please like and share this video with your friends and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this coming soon.